I could hear, she had one of those voices that were a little bit, um, you know, they just kind of penetrated the walls. And so you could hear her from the other side of the church saying it, and it just, yeah, it just makes me laugh. Okay, you ready? Now, we will be talking tonight about true love. And you know, the thing is, I had a slew of messages that, that, um, that I felt like I should do. Like, probably, I think, five or six in Toto. And, uh, yeah, Toto, that's the hip lingo. And, uh, you know, I didn't know, I couldn't figure out which one to do when, so I just started going down the list. And this is the first one on the list. And there were just so many different con confirming factors, you know, where it's to the point of this, that if I would have, if the people who I talked to the past week or two would have been here tonight, they would have thought that I was preaching to them. Because this message is literally exactly what came up in the last week's conversation. It's just crazy how that went. Um, did you guys ever see the movie The Princess Bride? Yes. There's this part, this is the marriage scene, where the pastor, or whatever the crap he is, he's like, marriage is what brings us together today. <laughs> Remember that part? Yes. Well, <laughs> when, when I think of, when, when we think of love, what, we, what do we think of, right? Mar wedding scenes, right? That's the, just kind of the, the stereotypical thing. But if you actually stop and think about what is love, and what does the Bible have to say about love, you arrive at a very different conclusion. You know, for instance, we misuse the word love. I love tacos, mm -hmm. right? Well, you don't actually love tacos. No, I, I love tacos. I love okay. tacos. All right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or uh, we misunderstand the idea of, of love. For instance, I love this person. Why do you think that? Well, because I have a feeling for them. And because I have this feeling, that means that I love this person. Well, that's actually not, <laughs> not what the Bible has to say about love. And see, what the problem is, is we allow our idea of love to be decided by the things that we hear on TV and, and listen to in music. I'll give you an example. When, when I married my wife... She told me, after the honeymoon phase ended, she said, I thought it was going to be more like on a Disney cartoon. You know, where you live happily ever after. You know, the good stuff with the princess and the prince and, you know, the fun stuff. That went away quick. <laughs> the, well, what is this, Michael? This is not what I signed up for. You know, and, and, and that just kind of proves my point. You know, we have this idea in our heads of what love is. So then we take that warped idea of love and we take it into our ministry we take it into our family, we take it into etc. And why is this bad? Well, you can obviously see, because if you base a marriage, for instance, off of a feeling, what happens when that feeling goes away? If you go to a church because it makes you feel good, what happens when it no longer does it for you? Well, then you just abandon the church. Because there was no actual commitment. There was no actual love. You had a feeling of, wow, this place makes me feel, is my mic on? It just suddenly went, oh. uh, you, you had this feeling of being entertained. You understand kind of where I'm coming from? So we're going to look at love tonight, and we're actually not going to look at 1 Corinthians 13 at all. And the reason why, two reasons. First off, because everybody thinks that that's the only thing the Bible has to say about love. It's not. And second off, because it's not actually talking about marital love. It's talking about the gifts of Oh, it's talking about the gifts of the Spirit and how they're used. Nothing to do with marital love. Yet, you wouldn't know that by going to, you know, weddings and stuff. They have 1 Corinthians 13 written everywhere. It has nothing to do with marital love. I mean, yes, some of those things do still apply to marital love. Absolutely. It's, I love this kind of an idea. But it's talking specifically about how we use the gifts of the Spirit. So I'm not even going to look at that. Um... So feeling something for someone or even being attracted to someone isn't love. Look at it like this. You get married. Usually people get married in their 20s or 30s, somewhere in there. You know, it changes from area to area. Some people get married in their teens. Some get, people get married in their 40s or 50s. It doesn't really matter. My point being that, you know, you marry this person, you think, hey, that's a smoking hot piece of something there. You know, well, 20 or 30 years later, guess what? You're not going to look like that. Not just them, you too. I mean, we get wrinkles, we get fat, we get hair growing everywhere. It's like, wow, where'd, where'd that come from? You know, and then we look at our high school our high school pictures and we think, well, what happened? Time has not been good to me. 
what, what did I do? Was it, was it the tacos? <laughs> <laughs> but they're so good. Uh, and it gets worse when you get married because your wife's always like, look, honey, I made you tacos. And you're like, no, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Anyways. Hey, there you go. Um, this doesn't mean you love someone any more than depressed thoughts make you worthless. Just because, let's say, let's say, for instance, you're going through depression and you're having thoughts that you are a worthless person. Do those thoughts make that true? No. Our worth is not decided by our view of ourselves or someone else's view of us. Our worth is defined by God. Why, why is killing a person such a big deal, but killing an animal not such a big deal? In the Bible. In the Bible. Because God specifically says, I have made man in my image. If an animal kills a man, kill the animal. If a man kills a man, kill the, animal, kill the man. Because we are of value to God. Our worth is not based off of our feelings. And it's the exact same with love. Love is not based off of feelings. We get in our head that because we feel something or because we think something, therefore it is. And we have to follow it through. Right? You see people do this with, with cheating and with adultery and all kinds of different things like that. You know, well, I feel attracted to this person and I'm not attracted to my wife anymore, so that means it's okay for me to cheat on my wife. No, our feelings don't decide whether something is good or bad. God decides whether something's good or bad, right? And love is not decided by a feeling because feelings will change, especially... If you struggle with things like anxiety and depression and everything, your feelings will change every five minutes. <laughs> so really hold on there. Um, okay. You can't fall out of love, but you can choose not to love. You, you, you hear this a lot with people with marital counseling. We just, we just fell out of love. You, you, it's impossible, physically impossible to fall out of love. You can fall out of like with someone. You can fall out of being attracted to somebody. That's totally normal. But you cannot fall out of love because love is a decision that you make. Now, I'm making this, I want to make this very, very clear before I actually go to why this applies to what we're talking about tonight, so that you don't get a little bit confused. So, 1 Peter 4 8, let's go there. 1 Peter 4 8. First Peter 4, 8. It says this. Above all, excuse me, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sin. Love covers a multitude of sin. Now what is he saying? If I love somebody, then magically everything is going to be fixed. No, no, no. If you have love for someone, you will cover the offense. You who are married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Your spouse is something really, really, really stupid, and you have the chance to hop on their throat, just and destroy them, right? It happens every single time. Wait another two weeks, and it'll be the exact same thing in reverse. This is like marriage is the never mind. <laughs> See that a joke that I kept to myself? Learn that for the holidays, you guys. <laughs> but if you truly love someone, you let it go. Just let it go. Now, how does that apply to what we're talking about? Love and action in ministry. Okay. Let's think. Uh, Chuck's, Chuck's, the, Chuck's over the youth. Okay. So let's say Chuck does something that really irritates me. I think it was the stupidest thing in the world that he could have done. Well, if I love my brother like Christ loved me, I'll smooth it over. And when the chance presents itself for me to talk behind Chuck's back about the stupid thing that Chuck did, I won't take it. Instead, I'll seek to bring peace to the situation. Do, 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 you, do you guys kind of see what I'm saying? Now, I say that because who's on Facebook? Yeah. Just a few people? Okay. All right. Well, you know people on Facebook, they, they, it's like... It's like a public poll for who can say the stupidest thing. 
So then everybody else jumps on their on their thing and tries to comment on their stupid thing that they said in the first place, and they all try to one up each other. Like maybe I can say something stupider than that person said. You know. Well, is that really showing love in the situation? Are you covering the offense, or are you broadcasting it about how this person wronged you? And then you get all these people who comment on on your nonsense and saying, "Oh, yeah, you tell them. You 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 know." It's like, oh my gosh. And the worst thing, the worst thing about it is, is when you're when you're trying to establish a, a relationship with these people in the community who aren't us. You know, they're they're not like us. They're you know they've never they didn't grow up in the church, and so you're trying to you're trying to get out of your comfort zone and not be Christianese around them. You're actually trying to be a person to them, and uh, you know then the, there's kind of this guard this guard that they put up, you know, and they're like, oh. It's you, it's you, the Christians. So they, they, they pretend to be like super, you know, righteous and, oh, I never cuss or anything like that. It's like, uh, okay, you don't have to pretend, but, you know, whatever. Um, but anyways, what fervent means, First Peter 4, 8, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. That, that's a weird word, right? Fervent. Who uses that word anymore? Fervent basically means deep or without ceasing. Have a deep love for one another. Have a love that is without ceasing for one another. That's, that, I think that's a... More of a modern translation, you could say. Did it kind of get the idea that he's saying there? Um, above all, keep without ceasing in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sin. The problem is, is we don't want to forgive someone, so we just let it stew. And so then somebody else does us wrong, and it's like a country song. I got heartaches by the number. You know, you, you, you can start keeping tabs of everything. Well, then everything looks dark because you're keeping tabs of everything. And so then you go and find other people who will help you hate this person as much as you already decided to hate them. And that's just a bad idea. So let's look at uh, John 15, 13. The Gospel of John, not 1 John. John chapter 15, verse 13. Remember, we're talking about love and action. Okay, John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. Now, I know everybody, when they talk about this, instantly talk about Jesus dying. I, I'm not trying to downplay that. I'm just trying to bring up a different point. Giving up your best interest for someone else is loving them. It's not in my best interest to do this for them. It's in their best interest to do this for them. That is love. And that goes for marriage, that goes to family relationships, that goes for church, it goes for any ministry you'll ever do in the future. When you first start getting into ministry, you want to show how smart you are. You want to be the smartest person in the room, especially if you're in a teaching kind of role. But then, throughout the course of time, you start realizing, what good is it to be a walking encyclopedia? Books are for sale. If they wanted a walking encyclopedia, they could just bought an encyclopedia on a tablet. People don't need people who don't care for them. People need people who do care for them. And a teacher has to teach so as for the other person's best interest. Is that kind of explain? Kind of what I'm getting at here? Love is about watching out for their best interest. Well, if anybody here has been married for longer than two days, you know that's excessively difficult. It's fine, you know, okay, yeah, I can I can do that or whatever for, for these people that I only see at Thanksgiving, whatever. Well then you get around someone that you're around every day. Okay, let's let's wind back the gears on that one. Uh, Proverbs ten twelve is another um, another gives us another little glimpse into um, into love. Oops. Proverbs chapter ten, verse twelve says this. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers, o covers over all transgressions. When you post stupid things on Facebook, would you say you're stirring the pot? Or would you say you're smoothing it over? When you come in contact with your friend who is upset about something, would you say that you're getting on their side and, and, and really stirring them up? Or would you say that you're smoothing it over? When your children are doing really stupid things, they're really irritating, really, really, really bad, you just want to give them a piece of your mind, are you stirring the pot or are you smoothing it over? See what I mean? 
as a Christian, our, what do you, what do you call it, prime objective, primary objective is to love. In fact, uh, John, who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, you know that John, he was recorded as his last words were, Dear children, love one another. And he was recorded as going around that he was he would always say that whenever he went to the different churches. He would always say that children love one another. He lived to be ninety something, I believe, I forget exactly, but he lived into quite an older age, and that would always be his mark. Everybody who would talk to him would always hear him say, Children love one another. And obviously children mean, you know, us, because he's an old guy. Everybody's a child, an old guy. I mean, come on. Uh, so creating peace and chaos, that's love. Being a peacemaker. This, I just got sucked in. Be a peacemaker. Well, they were already upset. I just wanted to let them know that I was there for them. Be a peacemaker. Be someone who goes into a situation that's not good and makes it good. See what I mean? Be that person. Because here's a little newsflash. The world has plenty of people who are stirring the pot. Have you read the news lately? Have you watched TV? People are getting upset about everything. Man, oh man. It's like they're just looking for things to get upset about at this point. Um, okay, so many people go from bad situation to bad situation for a feeling and try to prove their love. For instance, domestic violence, rape, unhealthy relationships, and they go from the, through these cycles of bad relationship to bad relationship, and it just repeats itself. It just repeats itself over and over again. And um, they, they always look for this thing, you know, based on this feeling, you know, oh, well, this is the one because I feel something. And they turn off their brains as to what wise decisions it's in. it is. And this is actually a very common thing, at least in Tularosa. I don't know about the rest of the world because I'm not in the rest of the world. I'm in Tularosa. Domestic violence is actually a really big thing here. And, you know, they keep getting themselves into these bad relationships because they want that feeling. They want to feel loved. Do you know what everybody wants to feel loved? You know that? Everybody wants to feel loved. When, when have you ever talked to somebody and they said, yeah, if you could be a total jerk to me, that'd be great. Um, let me just... In 2 Corinthians 6.14, um, it says this. If I ever make it there. It takes forever to flip through the Gospels. And then you get to the epistles and you go one page and you go four epistles down. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. It says, uh, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Now this isn't just talking about marriage. Christians should not marry non-Christians. Yes, absolutely. That it is saying that. However, it also said, you know, talks about something a little bit more than that, too. Don't bind yourself to unbelievers. See what I mean? And what we do is we have family members who aren't saved. And we don't want to give them up because we love them too much. So then we try and make them in, spiritually intimate with us. When God has given us a new family in the body. And so because of that, we don't connect ourselves to like-minded people who we can actually be there for. And instead, we try and go solo. We try to live like the world does. And we never open ourselves to that love that God has for us. You know, a lot of us have lost family, but, you know, God gives us a new family. And the family that we have here is an eternal family goes past blood. So don't unite with unbelievers. Um, you know, and here's another idea that I want to kind of throw out there. There's the idea of pearls before swine. Did you know that God won't bring you a spouse that is not, how do I want to say this, not in your league? Does that kind of make sense? God won't bring you someone who has their heart set on him if you're someone who's playing games with God. Does that kind of make sense? God doesn't bring pearls to pigs. And he actually tells us not to do the same thing too. If you are looking for a good spouse, a good godly spouse, be a godly person. 
If you think you're more righteous than your spouse, it's called pride, and you need to humble yourself and get back into prayer. If you think that you're better than your spouse, you are wrong. I don't have to know you. I don't have to know the situation. You're wrong. In fact, it's the people who think that they're better who aren't. Because there's this thing called pride. And, you know, it's surprising. All these things that we rank as of importance, God has pride way up there. That surprises me. Because in my male, young male mind, I think pride's not that big of a deal. In God's all-knowing mind, he says pride's one of the biggest deals. Well, okay, God. Um, so Proverbs 22, 3. You know what pastor's always saying, if you don't read the Bible, you just make things up. I found things in, when I was studying for this sermon that I did not know were in the Bible. The prudent sees the evil and hides himself, but the naive go on and are punished for it. Talking about, you know, spiritual, not spiritual, um, domestic violence and those kinds of things. When we go from bad situation to bad situation... The prudent sees the evil and hides himself. Don't excuse someone beating you. The prudent sees and hides himself. Don't excuse domestic violence. Do not marry someone who is physically abusive or verbally abusive to you. Don't pick someone who treats you like that. It doesn't matter what they say. Oh, I'll try harder next time. You know, I'll, you know I, w I won't do it again. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Don't marry someone who doesn't have that. Because what's going to happen is it will end in divorce. And then you're going to have to pick up the pieces and it's going to be tragic. Rather than worry about that, how about pick a good godly spouse in the first place? And it, what happens if you, have, if you have an unsaved spouse? Stick by them. Until they leave, do what's right, and you be the better person. What I mean by that, I mean when they say snide things just to get under your skin. Forgive them and move on. You do what's right. That's love. Love says, I'm going to do what's right, and I'm going to endure this. And remember, God will lead you through these things. So I want to hop on down there. Look at Luke 6:27. 28 says um, but I say to you who hear love your enemies do good to those who hate you bless those who curse you pray for those who mistreat you talking about what love says and what God what, what the Bible says is love we're seeing a whole lot of things that have nothing to do with how you feel when's the last time somebody has mistreated you and you have said man I'm just so thankful that they treat me like that no you get a little angry right don't look at me like, like everybody's getting all quiet all of a sudden. You don't like being mistreated, right? So even in bad situations, God is still in control. He can use it. Matthew 19, 29. Just wanted to read a few different... You know, what I found is when I have... More scripture references in my sermons, people usually get more from them because they don't read scripture throughout the week. And then I read things, and it will be genuinely the first thing that I that they, the first time that they've heard it. Matthew nineteen twenty nine says, uh, "And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life." There are some people who have pursued after God and have been abandoned by their family. There are actually a lot of those people. And this is God's promise to those people. When you leave those things for my name's sake, not you left them because you were tired of putting up with their nonsense, because it was the last straw, because you didn't want to forgive them anymore, not any of that stupid stuff. I'm saying when you seek after God and it puts, it puts a wall between you and them, God promises you right here in this passage something better. Sometimes we lose people in our lives. Forgive and keep loving. Because here's the thing. If you find a reason not to love, you will always find a reason not to love. Always. Guaranteed. You have to be a loving person. So, just a few more things. Um, 
Don't make your lives revolve around your kids. I hear this all the time. My kids are the center of my life. That's just a bad thing to do. Your kids don't need to learn how to be coddled and how to be the center of your life. They need to learn how to become part of the family unit and work together. See what I mean? Because in the real world, that's not how things work. And so they're going to go from being coddled and think that they're the center of the universe out into there. And what do you think is going to happen? It just I've never seen it go well. Not only that, but it's unhealthy because it kind of puts an, an immature uh, spiritual development on you because you find all your happiness and all your joy from a child rather than from God. Our children are meant to be the center of our lives. They're meant to be a part of our lives. Do you understand the difference? Very important difference. Anyways, um, you do what's right and sacrifice yourself for others, even when it's hard. Love like Jesus loves you. When you're in a conflict, ask yourself this. Am I loving the way that God loves me? That is a good test of whether you are truly loving. Um, so, for example, marital love and fights. <laughs> Church love when someone gossips about you. Well, they did me wrong. Well, you can either forgive them and love, or you can get hard. But you can't do both. Well, I'll just not love them, but I'll love everybody else. Can't do it. Love spreads, and so does hate. That's just a fact. You can't pick and choose. Well, I'll love everyone except if they're a Republican or a Democrat, whatever. Well, it doesn't really work like that. You have to love people. Love is not a feeling. It is an action that you choose to take. And so ask yourself, am I choosing to love as God chose to love me. Not based off of my merits, but based off of his goodness. We're going to close there. If I can have the Reverend Pastor uh, Randall uh, close us in prayer, and then when he's done, Joe, are you still back? Yeah, Joe's back there. Would you pray for the food when he's done? God, we thank you. Your word has shown us love and how to apply that to our lives. God, I'm asking that you would continue to teach us and show us, Lord, God, that we wouldn't have the prideful attitude that 